So it's been a long morning, a lot of lectures have all been very good, and I think this talk here is kind of appropriate, second to last, I think our last talk is on outcomes. But uh, you know, normally, uh, you know, we've done all the cool stuff, we've put in screws, we've you know, come from the side, we've taken off the rib head, we've done a corpectomy, we've treated trauma. But the last thing we usually think about is, is sort of the most important thing that we're trying to do with all of these techniques, which is to achieve a bone effusion. Um, and we sort of think about that at the end of the case. It's about six, seven hours in, you're tired, you're just like, oh, let's just throw something in there and get out. But this is actually sort of the most important part of the case. Um, and that's why, you know, if you actually do your own billing, you know that the putting in an extra seven levels of instrumentation gives you about one RVU, but, you know, in terms of fusion, it gives you about 70 add-on RVUs. And there's a reason for that, because the difficulty is in achieving the fusion. So these are my disclosures. So the learning objectives here are, are the uh, number one is to uh, remember the importance of obtaining arthrodesis. That's the point of most of these cases um, when you're doing complex spine. It's to understand some basics of bone growth physiology. So you don't do things to, to shoot yourself in the foot, um, you know, usually very basic things. Also to understand some of the properties of common bone graph extenders because as soon as you get out and practice three, four years from now, people are going to start magically showing up in your uh, office saying, I'll oh, use this. The studies have shown that this will give you like a 10,000 time the rate of fusion. And you need to know what they're actually offering you and what the properties are. And then you need to know how to prepare your arthrodesis sites. Um, you know, doing the decompression, taking out the tumor is important, but you need to also know what you're doing in terms of pre preparation for uh, arthrodesis. And then I also should have a knowledge of some of the factors that can either adversely affect arthrodesis and also some things you can do to help you improve offline. So why care about arthrodesis? Instrumentation, you know, that's all exciting. Uh, doing the big cases, you know, that's the Porsche. You know, we're all excited about that. That is really cool. But, you know, preparing for arthrodesis is like driving the minivan. You know, it's not exciting. You know? <laughs> but, you know, but this is what's actually going to get the stuff done. I mean, you know, you can't go to the grocery store. You know, I've got three kids. I can't go to Costco in, the, in that. But I can go to Costco in this, and I can take care of business. And this is what's going to get you there. And so you need, to, you need to know about that, right? And so you also need to watch out because you guys are building Porsches in the uh, operating room. Beautiful constructs. And then, you know what, if you leave and you don't care about, you know, how you're putting in the bone or what you're putting in, something bad is going to happen. You know, don't double park your Ferrari in Manhattan. It's just not a good idea. Pay for the valet. You know what I'm saying? All right. So here's some examples of what can go bad. You put in some nice, you know, intralaminar screws and then they halo because you didn't have a good, you know, uh, fusion. You know, it's not, this is not my example, but I borrowed this from Praveen. He saw this recently in clinic. Somebody did a gigantic you know, anterior operation and then you know if you don't achieve fusion and you don't back it up maybe posteriorly something bad is going to happen and that's horrible for the patient to go through and you could have you know done something to at least minimize the chance of that happening and then you do a nice big construct you do a PSO and then guess what you know you have rod fracture a year or two later because you didn't achieve arthrodesis. So doing the operation, getting off the table is important, but then long term for the patient, you need to take care of business and get it fused. <coughs> this is your view. I mean, I had this view. You know, it's late in the day. You're tired. Maybe your attending's like, you know, take care of this, and he's left, and he's dictating, or he's rounding on patients. And you just want to throw some bone in and clothes, you know, just get some of these morsels, you know, somewhere magically they appear, and you just throw them in. And then you close in this short-term gain, but again, long-term pain. And I'm hammering on this point, you know, it's repetitious, but that's, you know, how we learn. You're going to make a mistake, and you're not going to want to do it again. I'm trying to save you from that first mistake. So pseudoarthrosis it occurs in up to 40% of patients, especially in these longer constructs. The bigger you do a case, the more likely it is not to fuse. The more levels, the more likely it is you have a pseudoarthrosis. So you need to be aware of it and you need to know about this going forward, and you need to counsel your patients on it. Again, higher incidence in long level constructs, and it results in significant morbidity. Uh, oftentimes it results in another operation. Uh, sometimes it results in a much more difficult operation than the index or initial operation. And these reoperations do not give you uh, happy customers. And exactly, you know, you don't want to have your clinic filled up with that. I don't know if you guys see clinic as residents. A lot of residents are insulated from clinic. 
So this is where you're going to spend your time. You're going to spend you know, one-on time with people that aren't happy with you if you don't get them uh, treated as best as possible. So how to minimize, understand how bone forms, understand what you're putting in the patient. You know, why did you choose morselized little uh, kernels of allograft? Um, understand how to prepare the bone to give yourself a best chance of fusion. If you don't decorticate, you just throw a bone on top of it, it's not going to fuse. You know, place the graft in the appropriate place. Uh, make sure you're putting it in your bed. You don't just kind of throw it in there. If you're doing an anterior arthrodesis, make sure you prepare the end plates correctly. Uh, make sure you place your graft in the best chance that it has for fuse. Uh, you know, you don't want to impact your graft into one of the vertebral bodies and think you're done. That's not going to fuse. And then postoperatively, you know, manage your patients. Uh, maybe avoid uh, high dose uh, NSAIDs. Consider bone uh, stimulators um, as options for uh, people that are maybe at higher risk. Uh, bone formation, you know, this is, I'm not going to go over a, a whole lecture on how bone forms, but it develops from replacement of pre-existing connective tissue. And there really are several steps. The first is to lay down a uh, osteoconductive matrix. Then you want to have the factors in there that are which are going to induce the uh, cells that you need to form bone. Then you need those cells that are osteogenic. And finally, you also need a structural support, you know, especially if you're doing like an allograft up front, I mean, excuse me, if you're doing an a anterior um, disc space and you want to fuse a disc space, you need something structural. You can't have something that's soft. So you need all these things uh, in your uh, bone graft. Unfortunately, none of them are 100% perfect. And this is a busy slide. You can see this in many different uh, reviews on uh, uh, what type of bone grafts are available. But these are some of the basic ones that you have available. Uh, one of the most uh, you know, common ones we have are concellus autologous bone, either locally harvested or you know, even better, iliac crest. And that's going to have a lot of what you need um, in terms of uh, osteoconduction. Uh, osteoinduction is going to have the factors you need. Um, osteogenic cells are also there. Um, it's not going to cause an immunogenic reaction, which may impede your um, uh, uh, fusion. But it's not structural, especially if it's locally harvested or if you take uh, some Kinsellus iliac crest. It's not going to provide structural support. Uh, Corgo autologous will provide a lot of it as well and has some structural support. So like a tricortical graft, which we used to use for ACDFs, uh, that, that will uh, you know, be a nice uh, graft. has some other problems which we'll talk about. You have other options such as allograft, um, which again you know, loses some of the... Uh, um, the uh, uh, positives of autologous, but it's there, it's a good extender. You may not have enough autologous for a big uh, uh, operation. Demineralized bone graft is a uh, 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 DBM is uh, often used in, under various trade names, and that has some positives and some negatives. Uh, there are some people doing bone marrow aspirate um, and then adding that into other uh, um, uh, types of extenders, and that has some positives, some negatives. Um, and then you also have the, uh, the non. Um, uh, uh, basically the uh, artificial ceramics and other types which are also being used. All of these have positives and negatives, none of them nail it all the way across the board, uh, but the best are actually autologous. Um, they have the, most of the things that you, you want in a bone graft. Um, you know, there are some limitations such as amount you may have, um, if it's a revision perhaps the iliac crest has already been harvested. So there are some reasons to use extenders and you have to think about the extenders that you're using um, and make sure that you uh, use them appropriately. So iliac crest, I think, is, is a thing that we don't use uh, um, as much anymore due to some uh, uh, patient complaints, pain, and the like. But it's, a, it's one of the best things that we have out there. It's the patient's own. You know, you don't have any issues with uh, donation. Uh, you do have increased fusion rates uh, as compared to locally harvested autograft. Um, but there is some morbidity uh, in terms of complications of harvesting. Um, these can include post-operative pain. Um, if you harvest it poorly, it can be nerve injury. And so, you know, you need to know where to go. Uh, and this is something that you may not do a lot, but you want to make sure you avoid, like uh, this is posterior, you avoid the clunial nerves. You go into the sort of the primary area where it is and you uh, avoid going too deep. And it's actually not a very difficult procedure. Um, and it can give you a really good uh, uh, bone graft material. And you can also do it anteriorly as well. And again, you want to avoid uh, nervous structures and approach it um, in the safe zone. Uh, there's also uh, osteo, uh, uh, there's also factors, osteoinductive factors. This is one that you probably heard of. Um, I'm only speaking about the on-label use, which is anterior in a specifically threaded cage. 
but it's often used off-label. Um, and there's some contra controversy around it. Uh, there's been shown to have some increased fusion rates in the, in the literature, but not really improved outcomes. And there are risks of complications um, that you have to be aware of uh, when considering this as an option for your uh, uh, intervention. So then, the next step, you know what you're putting in, now you have to prepare it. And the first thing, I'm going to hammer on this again, is to know your patient ahead of time. You're not making this decision uh, sort of after six hours of operating when you're, you're not you know, as sharp. You want to know your patient. How old are they? Because uh, age is important. You want to know the comorbidities that may affect their ability to fuse. Uh, their smoking status is key. You do not want to be doing uh, cases on smokers. I've done that, and, and they can really fall apart more quickly than you would expect. And you want to know their overall bone health, especially for people that are older and you're considering doing large operations. And so get the uh, you know, DEXA scan, understand what their overall bone health is. And then when you're in there, you want to prepare your arthrodesis sites. Um, you know, plan which, what are you going to do? Are you, going, are you doing only an anterior, um, you know, the T-lift? Um, are you doing a T-lift plus posterior lateral? And then when you plan on it, prepare the sites correctly. Prepare your transverse processes. Expose them uh, if you're doing it open. And make sure you really truly decorticate them. Um, decorticate and, and uh, get rid of the soft tissue or the facets to help you fuse as well. And when you're doing anterior, uh, you want to prepare your end plates. And you want to make sure that uh, you know, the end plates um, are prepared properly, that you pick the correct graft that you're going to use. If you just throw in peak, um, is that going to fuse? Probably not. You may want to consider using uh, um, uh, you know, another substrate as well to help you fuse. Um, and then you want to pick you know, structural allograft, peak, titanium, or if you, uh, you know, if you go old school and, and, and harvest your own fibula or something like that. But that's probably not going to be in your choice. And then posterior, make sure you decorticate properly. Make sure there's good bleeding, that the, uh, there's a really nice uh, bed for you to get your fusion to uh, progress across. Which graph to use? Well, I can't really tell you that. Every, everybody is uh, uh, different in terms of their preferences. You want to make sure you have an effective graph. You want to avoid complications that you can easily avoid. Um, and then you want to make sure what you're doing is cost effective because coming down the road, you may not have a choice about what to use. There's a lot of insurance companies which really uh, limit you in, in the choice of bone graph extender because there isn't a lot of literature for a lot of that uh, you use out there. Some of it's experimental only in the rabbit model um, and some of it is not really uh, been shown to be more effective than just uh, basic structural allograft. And then other factors considered postoperatively, uh, radiation, chemotherapy, avoiding infections, all these three can really adversely affect your uh, arthrodesis. And you can consider bone stimulators in patients who are um, uh, higher risk, multi-level, because it is FDA approved to use these as an aid to, to arthrodesis. And I tell patients that there is a slightly increased uh, chance of you healing better. It's not that great, but it's better um, because, you know, if you have a 15% chance, better chance of fusing, you either fused or you're not. It's like being, you're not a little pregnant, you're not a little fused. You either fused or you're not. And so I, I recommend using that. So in conclusion, understand your patient, prepare your fusion site properly, and choose your substrate wisely. And these three things will help you uh, avoid uh, some catastrophes down the road. Thank you.